One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 19 because it does two things. The first half of the Psalm talks about creation and the beauty of creation. And the second half talks about the Torah or the word of God, creation and religion, faith and reason. And of course, you might remember how it opens. The heavens proclaim the glory of God and the firmament above shows forth his handiwork. Well, that idea that faith and reason, that creation and religion go hand in hand, that there are two wings by which we can come to know and understand God and the world, this is something rooted in our Judeo-Christian tradition. And yet today, many people think that science and God or religion are opposed. Nothing could be further from the truth, and that's what we're going to explore tonight. special guest tonight to talk about God and science. Dr. Karen Oberg is an astronomer and a professor of astronomy at Harvard University. She's an astrochemist and from Sweden originally, and she's an adult convert to the Catholic faith. And many of you probably have seen her on the search program that we have on the forum platform. In episode three, we talk about faith and science. And is there a God is the question of episode three. And she's one of the stars, one of those scientists that we interview that people were so moved by. And I know a lot of people who watched that episode were deeply inspired to see that science and religion and faith aren't contradictory. So Karen, it's a great pleasure to have you on tonight. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, let's just talk about, you know, what led you, first off, to follow and to make a career out of science? What, what led you to that? I think I might have been slightly brainwashed by my father from a very young age. I have a vague memory of science books showing up as far back as I can remember and little math competitions starting happening when I was four or five years old. So it might not have been completely on my own doing. Wow. Uh, but I did, um, uh, growing up, I, I did have sort of a hunger for understanding the word, and I think these were very natural curiosity. Also, a bit of an obsession about truth and accuracy, which you can ask my parents about how I would, how, how that would, uh, <laughs> let's say, um, be shown at dinner table conversations, not always in, in the most uh, <laughs> beautiful and charitable ways. But I think you combine this sort of obsession of truth, a sort of curiosity, and this sort of training from a very young age. Uh, so by the time I hit high school, I was more and more moving on to a path of, of the sciences, not yet knowing which science necessarily that I would focus in. Mm. Uh, that happened in college, but uh, getting getting a pretty, pretty strong feeling that that was what, where uh, I was going to be going professionally. Well, it makes sense that you had a love for math because to be an astrochemist, you have to really be good at math, don't you? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of math work. As I you, did. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and also a love of physics. Mm. But then I discovered I wasn't actually that good at either <laughs> and, and rather much better at chemistry, which is why I ended up being an astrochemist rather than an astrophysicist. Uh, very good. Well, as you decided, as you go into your career and you're studying and uh, you know, as an astrochemist, uh, and you're looking at nature, and one of the fascinating things, maybe you could just explain for a lot of people, they, astrochemistry, that's, most people don't run in, bump into a lot of astrochemists in their everyday life. So how do, you, how do we look at the chemistry in space when we're here on Earth? Why don't you explain that for people? Well, I guess the very first thing is just to establish that there is chemistry in space. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we often think about the space between stars as empty. I mean, with, when we look with our eyes, that's what we see. It's just like this darkness in between. But if you had eyes that could see with infrared or even longer wavelengths, radio wavelengths, you would see that in between stars, it's just full of stuff. Uh, it's full of gas. It's full of dust. And if you have gas, you have eventually molecules. And if you have molecules that can combine and fall apart, you have you have chemistry. So so it's it's there. Uh, the way we see it is the way that we see anything in astronomy, which is that we see it. Uh, you can't actually send probes out there to collect samples or anything. You have to rely on the light that's coming from the molecules to us. 
And luckily, uh, molecules, uh, they do emit uh, light of very specific colors when they rotate or vibrate. And we can pick up that, uh, those particular colors or particular photons with telescopes and therefore know that we have, we have molecules there. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fascinating. I want to ask you a couple questions about it. First, I want to invite people, if you've got questions about faith and science, um, please let us know and have, you know you can submit your questions to, uh, to Dr. Orberg and uh, the text line is 720-650-0100. So just you know, text your name and what your question is uh, for Dr. Orberg and again it's 720-650-0100. We'd love to have you join our conversation about God and science. Well speaking of God and science, uh, Dr. Orberg, I you know, I love that line from Psalm 19, you know, the heavens are telling the glory of God. You spend your career and your life studying the heavens. And I think of that, the Hebrew word for firmament, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're, you're thinking about and trying to discover these molecules and what's out there in the firmament. Is there, you know, as the psalmist said, d does studying the firmament, can that lead us to seeing that there is a God, that there is a design? Um, it didn't for me. Uh, so I, I am sure that there are people who have uh, gotten so inspired by sort of natural phenomena in general, and maybe the stars in particular, to want to go and look for why is there that beauty there? What does it mean that it's there? For me, the science was not unimportant to my conversion, but it was a bit of a roundabout way. And that when I tried to sort of think back, how I, I had a very fast conversion, there was like within a couple of hours, I went from being agnostic to a faithful Christian. Uh, and when I think back how that could possibly happen, um, I think in addition to you know, divine intervention and grace, uh, is that I had basically spent the past four years at that point just training my mind scientifically, which means, I think, training your mind to see that there is an objective truth out there that you have to wrestle with that's not going to go away um, mm. because you sometimes want to too. Uh, but also uh, to uh, look for truth and look for evidence that points towards one model and one understanding rather than another. And then to trust that you can recognize truths when you see them. You can recognize the true model of the word versus um, a false one. So, so I think I had this um, that kind of training actually made it very easy for me that once that I saw the evidence sort of piling up uh, for Christianity, it was quite easy for me to take that leap and accept it as true. I didn't um, wait and sort of ponder. It was a pretty fast decision in my mind to ascent uh, to the truths of the faith. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Ari. It was, a, it was a fast conversion, as you said. The next time, after that conversion, the next time you look into a telescope and you're looking at, at, into the heavens, did it look different after you believed? I wish I could say yes, because I think that in some sense should be the right and the correct <laughs> answer. But for me, it was a very slow process mm. to think about how my faith translated to different aspects of the word. In some sense, um, allowing God into the different parts of, uh, of my life. Uh, that took many years. So I had this very fast intellectual uh, ascent uh, mm -hmm. to the faith, but then actually sort of seeing God in the different parts of my life, including uh, my professional and including in the heavens, that was something that took many years mm -hmm. uh, and was a yeah, slow and sometimes painful process. What, what do you feel like you had to overcome? Because I, I think there's, and I, I, I would guess that there is, you're, you're so trained, you know, and we are in the world that you just, science is reason and faith doesn't belong in that process. And so do you think that came from, you know, I, I can't think of God when I'm doing the work of science, or is it just it something was never, that- It was actually never an intellectual kind of dilemma for me. I think it was more about a practical one. So I didn't know any Christians uh, mm -hmm. when I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any Catholics when I became a Catholic. Wow. So uh, I didn't have, I think, that community that show you how you practice your faith and sort of help you recognize where, where God is. Mm -hmm. uh, I did have a literary community in the sense that I had great authors that were very helpful for me during this process. But there is something about having a living community that I think uh, 
is really helpful. And I have it now and I'm super grateful, mm -hmm. but I, did, I think it took a bit longer because I just didn't have that community to sort of dialogue. Well, when, before your conversion, you, a lot of people in our culture believe that the idea of faith and science are antithetical. Is that something that you thought that you just kind of? No, I hadn't actually, I hadn't really thought about it, mm -hmm. uh, I think is the, is the uh -huh. truth. Uh, on the contrary, I think there were some facts about the word that made me very suspicious of uh, atheism or sort of pure materialism. Uh -huh. Uh, not necessarily scientific ones, but um, the what what I thought was an obvious truth that I have a free will to make choices, and uh, any model of the world that cannot take that into account is going to be a model of the world that I'm suspicious of. Um, also, I thought it was pretty obvious that there are uh, that um, there is a moral realism. In, in this world, that there are things that are good and evil, regardless of what people think about them. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, a model of the world that cannot incorporate that moral realism is, is not going to be one that was going to be in, easy to intellectually ascend mm -hmm. to. So, uh, so once I started thinking about things, which was prompted really by reading books, uh, really things just started falling into place. So for me, uh, sort of my mind, it was a great asset in my conversion. And then I think what took time was that sort of the charity part, the living out your faith and mm -hmm. actually building a relationship with, with God. I would say that's still still some of the work in progress, but uh, well, uh, I, but that was the hard part, not, not the intellectual one. In terms of the intellectual trajectory of your conversion, I love that you talk about it as you had this adherence and this love for truth. And so you were gathering these kinds of pieces of truth. This is this pillar of truth. This this has to hold, and this one, and then obviously something started to make all connections between the, those things with the Christian faith for you. And uh, is there anything in particular that was like, uh, all right, now there this bridge for these pieces of truth are now putting enough of the puzzle together that I can I can see God emerging. I wish I could say that I sort of sorted this out myself with the sort of childhood Christian education that I had received. And, you know, I, uh, but the, what happened was that I read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, he wow. sort of walked me through step by step. And uh, I, I agreed with his stepwise um, explanation of what the word is like. And uh, his uh, explanation of Christianity. Uh, was very sensible to me and, and had and uh, seemed to fit the data on you know the word that I had already gathered as well as what I remembered from the little I knew about the biblical story. Mm. Well, we have a question. Martin asks, you know, if is is belief in a god uh, contrary to science, or how no. do they explain? How does he explain <laughs> that belief in God is not contrary to science? Uh, so it's um, th this is actually something that uh, I have wrestled with with how to answer because to me it was a, a, just never a problem. Uh, it was never something that disturbed me at, at the least. I think I started out thinking about it as um, well. I know what kind of questions that science can answer, uh, what you can actually get to with a scientific method. And by its very design, this is actually quite limited. Now, I think we often overlook this because with this limited approach, we have done so much. Mm. And I think especially now in COVID times, I mean, I think we are in, a, in an era of really of appreciating what science can do. But the reason science can do so much is because it is quite specific and in some sense modest what its claim is. And the claim is that you can through the study of regular patterns uh, in nature, you can uncover the laws that sort of regulate the material world. And then by understanding those laws, you can then build technology, you can develop medicine and so on using your intellectual knowledge. If you believe in the kind of God that Christianity has always um, claimed to believe in, but is the creator and sustainer of the whole material reality, you are um, 
you, you're talking about the God who stands completely outside of what the scientific project could ever hope uh, to probe. So you can never use the scientific method to prove or disprove God. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't signs you can look for that sort of that appear when, when you are trying to understand what uh, this reality is like. Um, it is the, the creation of God, which means that uh, what creation is like does tell us something about God as a creator. Uh, I think the Big Bang is probably one of the most beautiful icons. So I could actually not think one could have imagined it better uh, of what uh, what creation is like, even if it's not exactly the same uh, as what we mean with theological creation. One of the uh, questions that Abby has is, can you talk about faith in your professional circles? Can you talk about religion? Are, are people comfortable with that? Uh, so it depends. So I am very open about being Catholic. So all my colleagues know that I'm Catholic. Um, the sort of administrators know I'm Catholic. The students know I'm Catholic. So in that sense, it's not something that I have had to hide. Uh, but it is also not something that I have in common with most of my colleagues, which means there's not really something that comes up naturally mm -hmm. in, in conversation. Uh, and typically, I think when you try to socialize with people, you try to build on what what you have in what you have in common, and this is this is not one of them. Uh, but I've definitely had some very beautiful moments, both with some colleagues who are Christian, uh, as well as with students of different different faiths, uh, where we have sort of uh, you know one on one uh, been talking about some of these uh, things together. So. I try to be open uh, and then sort of invite people to come and talk to me rather than, I guess, preaching to people sort of un unasked for. Well, I'm curious, you know, as an astrochemist and you're thinking of models as you're looking at these gases up in space, whenever I see, and one of the things that really moved me about episode three of the search is some of the visuals that. That, that that piece had of the heavens and the constellations and the cosmos. And it just always strikes me as breathtakingly beautiful. I mean, just stunningly beautiful. And I'm, I'm about to go backpacking in a couple of weeks up in the mountains in Colorado. And my favorite thing is when you get up there backpacking and the sun goes down, the stars come out. I mean, you can just see the heavens in their splendor in a way that you can't when you're down here in Denver. And uh, so do, do you get moved, at, do, you, uh, do you see the beauty or are you just thinking of mathematical formulas? I mean, and how does it strike you when you look at those heavens? Uh, so that is a great question. And the answer is I am moved. And the beauty is, uh, I think, in some sense just the same for me, just as stunning for me. I actually had a conversation about this just very recently. And I think the best way I can explain it, if you're not an astronomer, it's maybe the experience that I have if I am watching or like looking at a beautiful Renaissance painting and then you have uh, a, a painter like standing next to me and tries to explain sort of the different parts of the paintings and why they made that decision versus that one, how they have influences from these other artists. And on the one hand, I think that momentarily can sort of disrupt the magic of just like taking in the beauty of the painting but I think the next time you see it, um, mm. you see the beauty, but you also bring this extra depth uh, with you. So I don't think it has to be either or. I think you can actually uh, bring sort of the scientific understanding and the scientific wonder with you into those kind of viewings and get an even deeper sort of sense of wonder of how beautiful it is. I love that analogy of analyzing a painting, appreciating it, analyzing it, and then going back to it. That's a, that's a great analogy for it. Is there a particular, um, you know, all right, so now to use the, the, you know, I've got, there's Caravaggio's, I love Caravaggio's work, and I'll go back to those over and over again and see new things. Is, is there a particular image or, you know, constellation that you just keep going back to and that you just find really fascinating? So professionally, I have my favorite objects. They tend to not be chosen primarily because of beauty, but because they, they are the, there's some scientific puzzle that just keep keep drawing me, me back to them. But luckily, with a very recent development, development in my field, which is the arrival of this great telescope, ALMA, down in Chile, we can actually start to take pictures of the chemistry. Like we can 
the kind of these beautiful Hubble images that you see, they're mostly of dust. That, that's what you see, these beautiful structures. Mm -hmm. But uh, with ALMA, we can get similar pictures, but with photons or, or like colors lighting up where there are particular molecules. And that makes even the kind of objects that I'm looking at, which are the disks where planets are forming, appear beautiful. And this is, but this is a very recent thing in my field. Like up until very recently, I've just been looking at blobs and spectra, but now I actually get beautiful images. And it does make it more fun. Hmm. Uh, even if you sometimes can get sort of as much science out of the blobs as you can of these beautiful images, there is something uh, about being able to also work with this beautiful data that is inspiring. Uh, so, so yeah, there are a couple of, of these disks that are really nice. They have sort of phone number names, or I would tell them to, to you, but they, <laughs> they are, they're beautiful. Wow. Well, here's a question that Frank asks. He says, are, are there particular saints who explore the harmonious relationship between faith and science? Is there anybody in the history of the church that you look to is, oh, they, they got it. Uh, so I have a particular um, attraction to the Dominican order, which I think are the, you know, the, the nerds uh, of the Catholic faith. So St. Thomas Aquinas is, is, is obviously a very well-known sort of merger of, the, of faith and reason that has stood the test of time uh, within the church outside of it as well. Uh, his mentor, uh, St. Albert, uh, also a great, great scientist, yep. uh, as well as uh, you know, great, great saint. Uh, so those are a couple that, that I would look, mm. uh, look at that I just enjoy uh, thinking about and also just reading some of what St. Thomas uh, is saying and uh, some of the sort of recent uh, YouTube videos on all things Aquinas is where I end up spending a lot of my time procrastinating. <laughs> uh, yeah, Thomas is great. And even, even people like you mentioned the scientific method, Roger Bacon, right? He was uh, yeah. a priest who really gives us the foundation for what becomes the scientific method. And there, there's so many people in the Catholic tradition that people don't know were Catholic and scientists, whether it was Copernicus, uh, and, and, and many others, and even Galileo. This yeah. the Galileo affair was an in, you know intra-Catholic uh, affair between two very Catholic, very Italian men <laughs> with big egos. Yes, that that, that was certainly, and I, and I think I, I know people always like to use Galileo as see the churches against science, but one of the things I at least. You know, one of the things that Galileo got in trouble for is he was getting into theology and making theological statements that were kind of radical. And that's one of the things that provoked response. Not that, you know, cutting edge science was always going to be controversial, but I think he, he if he would have stayed out of theology and, and science, he would have fared a little bit better. Oh, I think especially if he had stayed out of calling the Pope kind of stupid, he would have fared much better. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the whole Galilee affair is fascinating. It is definitely not a science versus faith kind of affair. That is, uh, um, it's not so much a simplification as I think getting it kind of wrong. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a story of some really big personalities who don't like being told that they are wrong or what to do. And I think both the Pope at the time and Galileo could have been a bit smoother. <laughs> Uh, with with how they presented uh, what they wanted and, and didn't want, but I actually highly recommend people look into it because it is it is a fascinating yeah. sort of part of our history, but it is also tragic in that it did put the Catholic Church um, it it gave an image yep. to any anyone anti-Catholic uh, of the Catholic Church being anti-science, which is completely untrue. It, yes, I think that was the. That, that is the aftermath. I think a lot of people just think of the Galileo affair. Well, that's just evidence the church is against science, and, and that's far from, far from the truth. Um, you know, um, here's an interesting question on the form platform. Mark asks, how do you reconcile science with miracles? You know, Jesus walking on water and healings and things like that. So that, that's it. How would you answer that? Uh, it's a good question. So there are... Uh, so I don't think there's any conflict at all. I guess I should uh, start with. 
Um, so at the scientific, uh, in some sense, the miracles presupposes that there are laws of nature, which are what the scientific method tries to uncover. Um, if people, if everyone could walk on water, uh, it would not be a great sign that Jesus could walk on water. And the way that we understand miracles in the Christian tradition are like our signs. So these are signs of a divine providence or governance and uh, love uh, of restoration. Uh, but they only work as signs because they don't do what nature typically uh, typically does, at least not on the time scale that it works. So first of all, you can't really have miracles if you don't first have a scientific or proto-scientific yeah. uh, sort of understanding of what the world is typically, typically like. Uh, there's sometimes a confusion, I think, between miracles on the one hand and superstitions on the other. So superstition would be something like you break a mirror and summon pieces, you'll have bad luck, you know, for seven years. That you could disprove with a scientific method. But let's say a miraculous healing is miraculous because it can't be explained with a scientific method, but it doesn't like destroy the scientific method. It just shows that here's something that has gone uh, beyond it. So there's, I guess, two ways to start thinking, uh, thinking about it. Oh, I really like that. You know, and scripture, because I'm, I, I can speak into the scripture side because that's my area. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the term for Jesus' miracles, they don't use the word miracle in Scripture. It uses dunamai, which means mighty deeds. We get the word dynamite from. But the idea is that, in the biblical worldview, is that if God is the author of nature, there's nothing more natural than nature obeying its creator. And so he has authority over, uh, and that's the other term that's used, is Jesus' exousia, his authority over creation, which shows you that this is a signpost Something bigger than nature is here. It's the author of nature. But I think it's, it's interesting that the word miracle really becomes more of an enlightenment term, the idea of suspending or going against nature, whereas the ancient biblical idea was it's going above nature, but it's not working against nature. And I think that is kind of what you're saying. is It's not going against the scientific method. It's just that the scientific method can't validate it. It, it goes beyond it. So that's, exactly. yeah, well, you know, when people, um, and I, I know some of the testimonies in episode three on the forum platform where people can find uh, the episode on, on, on the search on, on faith and science, people say that um, they struggle with belief in God and they, they just assume culturally that science is pointing against faith in God. What would examples you would give how science can point not explain God or prove God, but be a pointer towards faith? Uh, so, so this is a hard one, because I think you really want to be very careful with this question. With this question. So I, I think there are things that point towards God. Um, but I think one, before getting there, just like a big caveat, I do not think there are specific scientific discoveries that prove God's existence. Right. Um, and, and this is sometimes something that's brought up, like even the Big Bang, I don't think is proof for God's existence. Uh, strange sort of evolutionary details, I don't think is proof for God's existence or the origins of life and so on. But what I think the scientific, first of all, the scientific method reveals is just how intolerable the universe is, just how law uh, abiding in some sense the universe is. And this goes straight back to the Psalms and something that the psalmist wonders about just how regular and how ordered uh, the universe is. And that this, you can't assume this to be, this, this, is, this is not obvious that it has to be this disordered this and that there's something in the order out there that corresponds to what we can understand mm. uh, in here. This is magnificent. And this is yeah. something I think we, we should appreciate a bit more. So I think just uh, just that part or like that fact about the universe we live in, that really po does point to a lawgiver. And I think that's something that the Hebrews saw. I think it's something that we can see and something with even more wondering clarity today. But then I think there are also some things like the Big Bang, which I said is in no way proof of creation, but it, I think it is rather providential that just as we were moving into more sort of atheistic age, 
is when we discovered that the universe, at least from our point of view, does have a beginning and a really spectacular beginning that really gives us an icon of creation. I think the best time I could possibly imagine. I love that. And it reminds me of how you began your story about you love truth. You know, this is that, that's what led you into science is you love truth. And I think that's the one of the things that I have a deep conviction of is the people I know who are work in science, they have a passion for truth. And I know the people who work in the church and love Christ and have a serious Christian faith, they love truth. And I think, you know, that's that's the unifying thing with religion and science is they're both pursuing truth. There's different means to obtain that truth. In religion, we get it through revelation. But in science, we get it through reason and, and looking for the order of things and the truth of, of things. And I think that uh, I think for people who are struggling, keep pursuing truth. And like, like in your story, you, you know, your pursuit of truth led you to God and uh, or, or God led you through that pursuit of truth uh, by his grace. Well, thank you for sharing. I, I can't believe our time is over, but I, I, I just want to thank you for um, making the time. And uh, it's been a delight to speak with you, Karen, about these about your story and about your pursuit of truth. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's a blessing. Well, I hope everybody can join us again. Next week, we're going to have Rosemary Vanderweel, who is a great educator, and it's gonna, we're going to talk about the formation of children through education. She started a classical education school here in uh, the Denver area, and it's become an extraordinary school of renewal and, uh, and a real magnet for renewal of Catholic education. And so we're going to talk about Rosemary's insights into Catholic education for the formation of children as they pursue the truth. And we want to grow these children to pursue truth and reason. So thank you everyone for joining us and may the Lord bless and keep you all.